Well, good morning, everyone, and a really warm welcome to church. Uh, those of you who are joining us on Sunday morning, welcome. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be gathering a number of us together, watching, uh, watching this and worshipping together in spirit, if not uh, physically, uh, here in the building. And for those of you joining us later, a warm welcome to you as well. And I trust that God will speak to you as well uh, as, we, as we spend some time worshipping him and praising him. Well, it's been a fascinating week to uh, live in Aberdeen and to uh, see our city on the front page of newspapers as we've gone uh, back a, 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 step, a, step or, a stage or two in the easing of, uh, easing of the, 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 the lockdown due to the outbreak in our city. And, and you may be aware that we as, we as a church, we've been talking about the potential of, of getting back here, um, you know, no, certainly no earlier than, 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 uh, than this month. Um, and we, we, we ran a survey uh, last week just to find out how many of you would come and, and all the rest of it. And we were kind of planning on all of that. Um, and obviously this is kind of uh, potentially thrown a spanner in the works and we, we're just going to have to wait and see uh, what uh, what is said on on Wednesday regarding uh, how we how we can move things forward? We're still planning to have the big clean uh, on uh, on Saturday this coming Saturday. So please sign up for that. And if we find that we're not able to do it, um, then obviously we'll let you know, um, and we will potentially have to put that back um, if if we're not able to, uh, to 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 come together and to do that. So. Um, let's open in prayer, and uh, we come today, and our, our theme very much is, 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 is Jesus today. We're going to be thinking about, uh, the, the, the message title is Christianity is Christ. We're going to be looking at some of Peter's sermon where he really focuses on the fact that, that the Christian faith, um, it's not just a, 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 a pack of good ideas, it's about a person. Uh, it's rooted in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. So let's pray um, and commit our time to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that the faith that we have is not, it's not a philosophy. It's not based on trying to, in our own strength and in our own way, work our way up to be acceptable to you. We thank you that Christianity is about Jesus. It's about Christ. And we just want to thank you as we, as we begin this service. We just want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the wonderful man that he is. Lord God, it's, it's remarkable that in Jesus we have a, a man who is fully God and fully man in one person. And Lord God, I, we, we can't get our heads around that sometimes. And yet we thank you that it's the most precious thing that we could ever know. Uh, and so we just want to come and we want to say, we want to come today and worship Jesus. We want to worship our Savior. We want to worship the one who has come and who, who we are aiming to emulate in our own lives in, 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 as we seek to become more like him. Uh, in, 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 in our lives. And Lord God, we just thank you for the glory of Jesus, for all of the, the, the miraculous works that he accomplished, for his amazing death on the cross, taking the, the burden of our sins upon himself, for the resurrection where he came alive. And thank you that Jesus is alive forevermore. And thank you that he's seated at your right hand in heaven. Lord God, we come and we worship Jesus, our Saviour, our Redeemer, our Restorer, the one who is the bread of life, the one who is the light, the one who is the resurrection and the life. We come and we pray, Lord God, help us to worship that Jesus. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord, that we might, we might see Jesus in an, an even clearer light today and worship him even more. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, great. Uh, let's, let's, let's begin. We've got a relatively simple service today. Jules is going to be leading us uh, in some worship. 
Some folk from the church are going to be reading Psalm 1, one of my favourite psalms uh, for us. And then we've got, uh, uh, Tim has a, a video directed towards the students uh, at this time as, as they prepare uh, to return uh, to Aberdeen. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jules, who's going to lead us in some praise. Good morning. Welcome to Jared Street Baptist Church. We're going to start off by singing a couple of songs uh, focusing on the name uh, of God, the, the name of our Lord. Um, Mary was asked to name her son Jesus, which means uh, God saves. And so we'll, we'll focus a couple of songs on that name.
is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in the season and its leaf does not wither in all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like trap that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I think a real highlight for me has to be the student launches. And that was such a useful way to welcome new folks and to get to spend time with folks that you knew through students, Jared Street. Being able to see the growth in my life. And it's been nice getting to see um, the growth and spiritually and in other ways in, in everyone else's life around me as well. To be a part of that, that journey with them. And a highlight for me at Jared Street is definitely Jared Street at 6.30. Um, I love seeing the students in kind of one place, but the talks were really focused. Um, it was like always a series and kind of things that we could like look forward to and look up before, and that's something I really appreciate. Each year, students come and are a big part of our family at Jared Street. We love to walk with you in your years in Aberdeen, and we invite you to come worship God hear God's word preached and serve God's people alongside us this year. Students join our Terminally Connect groups to grow amongst the rest of the church community. And there is the opportunity to be adopted by a person, couple or family in the church who can feed you and look out for you during your time with us. Jared Street at 6.30 is our Sunday night gathering for students and young adults. And we want the gospel to be at the very centre of our community. So to that end, we eat together, we hear the Bible taught together, and we pray and sing together. The gospel also gives us three other particular values as a student community. We are called to authenticity. We are often told to look the right way, to have the right grades, and to say the right things. But the gospel says we are free to be honest about our weaknesses and our failures. We are committed to community. We are often told that only we define ourselves, 
This leaves us feeling lonely and isolated. But in the gospel, there is true belonging and true community where we serve each other. We are driven to multiply. We're often told, grab what you can while you can. But the gospel gives us the freedom to invest in each other and those outside, passing on and multiplying God's good gospel work. This year, you're invited to join us. focus on a couple of songs that look at our response to Christ, what Christ has done for us in, in giving himself on, on the cross.
who has brought us out of darkness into light. We thank you that we can stand in your light, gathered together, your people, your light to this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come now to uh, look at God's word together and uh, we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Acts. And you may remember last week we, we looked at the, the first part of, the, of Peter's sermon after Pentecost. And the, the, the people were saying, well, they were amazed. They were like, what is going on here? Uh, some, some thought they were maybe drunk. And so, so Peter deals with that straight on. And, and he, he also goes on to explain that actually what is happening is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to continue looking uh, at Peter's sermon. We're going to just let's, let's, let's read it together, starting at verse 22 um, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the divine plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I must, and here he's, Stop the quote now. He says, Brothers, I must say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb, maybe maybe it was within sight, is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, But he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel know therefore for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you have crucified. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for this remarkable uh, sermon that Peter preached. And we just want to pray right now that you would help us to grasp its meaning and to receive it in our hearts that you might be honoured through our response to it and to the preaching of it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever wondered how it is that there are some quote-unquote Christian leaders who don't seem to believe anything. We don't seem to hear about it so much these days, but certainly back 10, 15, 20 years ago, you used to hear about uh, bishops who, 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 who didn't believe in the resurrection or didn't believe in the virgin birth or, or, or whatever. Have you ever wondered, how, what, what is it that makes folks like that? want to be Christian leaders? What is it once, why do they want to be part of the church? If they don't believe this stuff, why do they want to be involved? So I want to try and explain to you their rationale, their thinking. What they think is something like this, and you'll you'll forgive me if if I don't 
give them the best. Uh, there may be things that I, I don't say or do say that, that are wrong, but, but basically how they think is something like this. They, that there was a good man called Jesus and he had some brilliant teaching and he died. And after, his, after he died, his disciples wanted his teaching and his example to live on. And, and so what they did was that in order that it might live on, they invented some stories about miracles and resurrection and miraculous birth and, 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 and all of this so, so, that peop, so, so, that his, so that his teaching would carry on. And so what they argue, therefore, is that our job isn't, isn't to defend the miraculous, but our job is to find out, well, what was the early church like? And what, how can we live like that? And how can we learn from that? Now, I've tried to be as fair as I can, um, but I need to, you need to know that as a, as a Bible-believing Christian, I, I, I find this whole way of thinking, uh, frankly, quite ridiculous. You know, for, for, for one thing, the, the gospel accounts are written as history. They're, they're written, I mean, you, you take the beginning of Luke and the, even the beginning of Acts that we looked at at the very beginning of this series. They, they're written as history. They read like history. They, 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 that, that, that's how they, they come across. You know, I, and, and, then, and then I think, well, would, would, would Peter and the disciples actually be willing to, because they all died for their faith, would they all be willing to die for a good man and his teaching carrying on? This doesn't seem to make sense. And, and, and yet the, the, the main reason why I, I, I feel that this is a, a ridiculous way of thinking is, is that Peter, in this sermon, and we find this all through the New Testament, is that what, what, the, what the apostles say is very, very clear. They say that we looked at Jesus, we saw what he did, and as a result of us reflecting and contemplating on what he did, we have come to the conclusion under God that Jesus is the Lord and the Christ, the Messiah. And that's exactly what we see here, isn't it? I mean, in verse 22, um, he, Peter says, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. And yet at the end of the sermon in verse 36, he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made this man, Jesus of Nazareth, both Lord and Christ. And so he gets from Jesus the man to Jesus, Lord and Christ through what he says in between. And what he says in between isn't, oh, well, his teaching was good and we thought we'd make, no, we, 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 we understand that this man is Lord and Christ because of what he did in his life. And, and so, so that's, that's the kind of introduction to, 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 to this, this passage. What, 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 what Peter is trying to say here to these folks, is, is the, and, and what I believe he would say to us today, is that Christianity is Christ. It's not a philosophy. It's not a list of rules and regulations. It's, it's, it is, Christianity is Christ. That's what it is. And, and so we, 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 come, uh, we come to this and we, we see, because and, and, well, what Peter effectively does in this, in this passage is that he takes this belief that he has that Jesus of Nazareth is Lord and Christ. And he says, I want to show you from his life I want to show you evidence to prove it. Because remember, he's speaking to people who were at best neutral and, and probably more normally hostile to uh, the Christian faith. And so he, he, he goes and he, he, he gives four, he talks about four things. And I want us just to really quickly look at these four things. Four evidences that have led him and the 11 men who are standing beside him and, and the other believers as well 
to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. And the first one in verse 22, he says, first of all, I want you to, I want to put on exhibit the life of Jesus. It's, he says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. He doesn't try to justify Jesus' miracles. He doesn't try and defend, he doesn't argue for them. He, everybody knows Jesus did amazing stuff. Everybody knows about the, 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 the miracles that he did, about the, 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 the blind people who saw and the deaf people who heard and the lame people who walked and the, the demonized people who were freed and, the, and him walking on water and, and all the rest. Everybody knows about this. Everybody knows about it. And, and there's so many witnesses to it that it, it's, it's undeniable. And he says, he says, he, he calls these three things, he, he calls them mighty works, and he calls them wonders, and he calls them signs. And mighty works basically emphasize the fact that these were demonstrations of God's power in the, in, 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 in the world. Wonders speaks more about the response that people had to them. People responded to these things with astonishment and awe. And then signs makes the point that these weren't ends in themselves, but they were actually pointing to a great spiritual truth that was really the key point that was trying to, 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 to be got. So let me give you, try and give you an example of this. Imagine that you followed Jesus out into the wilderness one day because you wanted to hear him teach. And you're listening to his teaching, and it's just amazing. It's remarkable. And you're, you're caught up in it, and you don't want it to stop. But you're getting hungry. And your tummy's beginning to rumble. And, and your, your wife's tummy's beginning to rumble. And your kids are beginning to moan about being hungry. And, and, you, and, and, and you, you, you look, and, and the nearest town's miles away, and you think, well, this is hopeless. But then Jesus does something. Jesus takes some crumbs, a few loaves and fish. And you, and you look at this, and you, th you look at the, the thousands of people with you, and you think, well, this isn't going to go very far, is it? And yet he then gives us this small amount of food to his disciples. And I don't know how it happened, but by the time it gets to you, you, you can take as much as you like, and you have your fill, and your wife has her fill, and your kids have their fill, and everybody's, everybody's contented and happy. And at the end of it, the disciples go back to Jesus, and there are baskets of food to spare. And, and, and you're just awestruck. You're astonished. You're amazed by this. That this you, your, your, your first reaction is that, well, God must be at work here. And then you're astonished. And, and, and so when Jesus goes, you, you want to follow him and you, 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 you follow him. And the next day, when you finally get, get to him, you, he, he says to you, you people have followed me, not because you want to know about me and about what I'm about, but you're, you're actually just following me because I fed you. And then he says, but I am the bread of life, and he who eats of me will never hunger, and he who drinks of me will never thirst. And what he's saying there, he's saying, look, the point of that miracle, the sign that miracle was, yes, sure, I, I cared about you people, and therefore I fed you, but there was more to it than that. I was pointing to the truth that those who eat of me, those who drink of me spiritually, will always have enough to eat and will always have enough to drink. They will be spiritually satisfied just as you were physically satisfied when I fed you all yesterday. And that's the sign, you see. And so the miracle... Yeah, it's a, it's a mighty work. God's at work. Yeah, it's a wonder. Wow. But it's also a sign pointing to a deeper truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter says to the crowd 
He says, you saw these miracles. You saw what they were pointing to. And I want you to know that the sign, the big sign above all other signs was that this was pointing to the truth that Jesus of Nazareth, the man, is the Lord and is the Christ. The second evidence that he brings up, the second piece of evidence that he brings up, is in, we find in verse 23, which is his, the death of Jesus. He says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Maybe there were some people in the crowd that day and they were beginning to think, yeah, they were amazing miracles. Maybe, maybe he is the Messiah. And then they're thinking, but wait a minute, he's dead. They see the Jews, they were looking for, they were looking for a, a Messiah who would come and who would free them from Roman oppression. Oh, a dead man can't do that. A dead Messiah. One commentator has said a dead Messiah for, for the Jews it was like, it's like fried ice. It didn't work. And, and, and so, so Peter is, is, is saying, he, he, he deals with this head on and he, he goes to them and, 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 and he, 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 makes, he makes a really important point about Jesus' death. And he says that this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified him and killed him by the hands of lawless men. And what, what, what Peter does here, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but what Peter does here is that he makes it clear that, that it, one of the most important truths in the Bible is that there is an apparent paradox between God being sovereign and completely in control and human beings having real choices and real responsibility for the choices that they make. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I sometimes struggle to, to, to hold these two things together. But one thing I do know is that the Bible teaches both. And if we're going to be biblical Christians, then we need to believe both both that God is in control and God, why did Jesus die? Well, he died because he was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And yet that, doesn't, that does not mean that those who were responsible for his death weren't responsible for it. They made real choices. Because he goes on, he says, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men be held accountable for your lawlessness. And these two realities, the sovereignty of God and the free, real choices of human beings are found all throughout the Bible. And if we're going to be faithful to Scripture, we need to hold both and not try and explain one away by emphasizing the other too much. And so we come to the, 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 the point, and I guess the point is, ultimately, who was responsible for Jesus' death? Ultimately, who killed Jesus? And you could start off by saying, well, it was the Roman soldiers. It was the, the soldiers that, that, that put the nails in his hands. They killed him, did they not? And you could say, well, yeah, but let's go back a little bit. And was it not Pilate? But why didn't Pilate stop this crucifixion? Why did he allow this crucifixion to go on? And then we could go back a little bit further. Well, yeah, but he was being pressurized by these Jewish leaders who were, who were, who were pushing him and were threatening him uh, if, if he didn't do it. And then we could go back a bit further, maybe to Judas, and say, well, maybe it was Judas and, 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 and then that betrayal that, that he had. And then we could go back a little bit further and we could, we could say, well, actually, wait a minute. Was it not Jesus himself? Did Jesus not, in, in, in the garden of, of Gethsemane, did, did he not say, not, not, not my will, but your will be done? Was it not Jesus then? And yet if we take that back a step further, not my will, but your will be done, we come, don't we, to God himself, to God the Father. And we come to this remarkable reality that ultimately, Jesus' death was his 
voluntarily, voluntary, willing agreement and obedience to the plan of God that he went to the cross because the purpose of the cross was to redeem and restore the broken and the fallen world. And he went. And Peter says, that's not weakness. There's nothing more brave. There's no braver moment in the history of the world than that moment. There's no more sacrificial moment in the history of the world than that moment. There's no more selfless, selfless moment in the history of the world than that. That was not weakness. That was strength in spades. And he, yeah, he might not have, the, the, you know, the Romans might still be here, but you know what? Because of his death, you're freed from your sins. And so Peter, Peter comes and he, 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 he deals with that objection head on. He says, actually, the death of Jesus, that isn't weak. It's not weakness at all. It's another point of evidence to the fact that he is the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And then he goes on and he brings the third element of evidence, the life of Jesus and his miracles the death of Jesus. The third is the resurrection of Jesus. And he deals with this in verses 24 right through to verse 32. And he, 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 says, he says in verse um, in verse 24, God raised him up. Well, I want you to understand this. It, it was God who raised him up. But one of the reasons that we know he's the Messiah from God's perspective, God was the one raising him up. And then he, 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 he goes on and he, and he says, loosing the pangs of death. I love that. And then he says, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He makes a, a theological point here. It, was, it wasn't possible for Jesus to be held by death. Why not? Why wasn't it possible for death to hold him? Because he was God himself, the infinite one, the eternal one, the immortal one. A tomb can't hold infinity. Time can't swallow up eternity. Mortality can't overwhelm immortality. Again, it wasn't possible. He's the Lord. He's God the Son. Don't you get this? And then he goes on and he talks about David prophesying beforehand about uh, somebody who, uh, verse 27, his soul wouldn't be abandoned to Hades, holy one wouldn't see corruption. And Peter goes on, he says, when, when, Peter, when, when David was speaking this, he was speaking as a prophet. He was looking forward. He was looking forward to the Messiah. He was looking forward to Jesus. And here's another bit of evidence that shows that Jesus truly is the Lord and the Messiah. We saw it. And he's probably looking at the 11 guys standing beside him. We, all, we were all there. We saw it. We saw Jesus appear on numerous occasions. And we are convinced um, as, as, as eyewitnesses of this, that this tells us who Jesus is. He truly is the Lord and the Christ. But then there might be one, might, maybe some others in the, in the crowd there and they're thinking, well, where is he? And so Peter brings his fourth element of evidence and he says, Jesus has now been exalted to the right hand of God. Verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. He basically tells the crowd what happened on the, the day of ascension. And we looked at that a few weeks back, so we're not going to go into it, but, but Jesus ascended in front of the, the apostles and the believers and, and was hid behind a cloud and went to be seated at the right hand of God in heaven. And, and somebody in the crowd might say, well, how, why are we to believe that? And Peter says, because of what you've just seen. 
Because what happened when Jesus went up to heaven was that God the Father gave to Jesus, this is verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing. So what happened was Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. God the Father then gives him the gift of the Spirit and Jesus then pours out the Spirit upon his church. And, and Peter says, there's your evidence. There's your proof. You, you, you people from all over the world who've heard the, 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 the works of God being, the excellences of God being proclaimed in your own language by ignorant Galileans. Why, why have you been able to do that? You've, you've been, why have you, you know, you, that is because Jesus has poured out the Spirit. And as we saw last week, the prophecy of Joel has been fulfilled. And so Peter concludes and he says, therefore, in verse 36, he says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made this Jesus, this man from Nazareth, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you have crucified. And the, the remarkable thing about all of this is that what we have here is we have this amazing evidence trail that, 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 that takes the man Jesus and systematically look at his miracles, look at what they point to, look at what they're signing, look at his death. This was no ordinary death. This was him following the plan of God to rescue the world to do messiah work look at his resurrection death couldn't hold him and then look at his exaltation and, and what what other conclusion can you come to than that this jesus was the lord and the christ and what he's seeing as i said at the beginning is that christianity is christ I just want to say quickly to anybody who's not a believer, you're watching this, you're not a believer yet, I want you to understand that Christianity is Christ. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And his, his arms are wide open right now. And he's beckoning you and he's inviting you to come. And all you have to do is you need to pray and say, Lord Jesus, I, 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 I don't deserve you. I don't deserve a relationship with God. But I come to you and I want to be part of your body. I want to be part of your church. I want to be part of your family. And he'll forgive your sins and he'll welcome you in when you do that. And any, those of you who are believers, I just want to encourage you that remember, 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 your faith is Jesus. It's Christ. That's what it is. It's all about him. He is the center of it all. And, and, and you know, I guess whether we're in church or whether we're watching a, a, a YouTube video at home, whether we're, you know, whether we're out, um, we're out doing our work in the, in, the, in, the, in the marketplace, we're doing our hobbies, whatever we're doing, build your relationship with Jesus. That's the priority. That's the priority. There's all sorts of other stuff that get, gets caught up in, in Christian work and Christian thinking and all the rest of it. But the number one priority, build your relationship with Jesus. Get to know him better. Read your Bible. Pray. Ask for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And meditate. Listen to what God is saying to you. Because Christianity is... Christ, no more and no less. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that the Christian faith is, 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 is not about us trying to get ourselves right with you by being good, but we thank you that it's all about Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, that you would just come now uh, and that you would help those of us who already believe in him to, to get to know him better. Help the, particularly those of us who have maybe not been faithful in our devotional times, not been 
uh, not being seeking God, seeking Jesus uh, in the way that we maybe did once. Help us to get back on track. And I just want to pray for any who are not believers yet. Lord God, would you come, would you convince them of the truth of what's been said today? And would you help them to come to Jesus and be his, one of his followers from this day on? And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to hand over now to Jules, who's going to lead us in our closing worship. Thank you so much for joining with us today. I really hope that you have found uh, this service to be a blessing, to be helpful to you uh, as you as you move forward. Um, and uh, yeah, let's just continue to, to to remember one another in our prayers. Um, and uh, let's pray that soon we'll be able to get back together and to fellowship together face to face in this auditorium. Uh, that we all love so much. So let's pray uh, in, in closing and uh, let's just commit one another into God's hands. Father, we thank you so much that we are the church, that we are the community of faith. And we just want to pray for one another. We pray that you would help us to walk with Jesus in the midst of this strange situation that we find ourselves in. Help us to honour him. Help us to live for him. Help us to become more like him. And help us to depend on him every step of the way. And we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining with us. We'll be having, if you're joining us live, we'll have tea and coffee straight after, uh, a Zoom tea and coffee straight after the, uh, the, the, straight after the service finishes. So please join us for that. If you want to give, uh, you can give online. Details are, are underneath this video on the YouTube page. So uh, please feel free to do that. Have a great week and God bless you all.